So first off, thank you very much for welcoming me back. This is not my first time speaking for the GTA log. I was here a couple years ago talking a little bit about NODB internals. So today I'm coming to you with another storage engine. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, my name is Pete Sylvester. As you can tell by the photograph, I love golf. Um, very enthusiastic player. When I'm not doing that, I'm a database administrator. I work for a company. I work with people. One of which actually whom happens to be here from Ottawa today, that's Bjorn. Together we collaborate and we work for companies who have logos. <laughs> but I did not come here to talk to you about that today. Today I came here to talk to you about MyRox, which is a storage engine, uh, which is basically a way to connect to RoxDB directly through MySQL. Now, um, right now it's currently available for Percona Server 5.7 and MariaDB. It is downloadable as a Facebook project for MySQL community, but that's not the most common implementation for this. And you're going to notice here on the slide, I do have Percona uh, server in bold. The reason for that is all of my research, all of my testing was based on the Percona uh, fork of MySQL. Your mileage may vary as you go from fork to fork, so just giving you guys that heads up early on. So the reason why we're talking about this uh, stems from something that happened back in December of 2018 when Percona actually made an announcement stating that they were going to be deprecating TokuDB as a storage engine for Percona. So Percona 8.0 is going to be the last version where this is going to be made available. Uh, and they basically were telling people, hey, you may want to start paying attention to MyRox as this is now a storage engine that's being made available to you. So this grabbed my attention. Uh, you know, it's not very often we see uh, forks like Percona or Community dropping support for an engine. So obviously that's an indicator that something big is coming. So uh, I did a lot of research uh, and I found that this is something that's actually being used for other up and coming projects like PingCap, uh, CockroachDB. And another big thing that really made this grab my attention is that this is actually being reviewed uh, by Cassandra, who is another log stru structured merge index provider. And they're looking at this as something that may be actually more performant than what they're already offering. So they're looking to integrate it into their solution. So I started researching this, and uh, when I've researched storage engines in the past, usually the problem that I have is that there's an overabundance of information, uh, which is often ambiguous or contradictory, uh, and usually you're going out there and you're trying to find some form of truth as to what's actually being presented. In this case, it was actually quite the opposite. Uh, there was a there's pretty much a vast absence of information, save for a few disjointed wikis, presentation slides. So I had to spend a lot of time doing some research, and once I was done, I figured, well, uh, I, I have some good information at my hands, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to create a blog series. You can find that on the Pythian site. Uh, it features these topics right here. Um, probably take about six or seven hours to read through all of it, but today uh, we don't have that kind of time. Uh, we're going to be covering just the very high level of what this storage engine has to offer, mainly focusing on data in, data out. Very high level stuff. This is a 101 level introduction to the storage engine. If you want more details, I would highly recommend you go back and you check out that blog series. So jumping right into it, one of the big first differences that we look at when we're looking at RoxDB as a storage engine for, yeah, storage engine for MySQL is that we're moving away from your come B tree uh, descriptions of data and we're going into a key value store. Uh, I would actually say this is probably not something that's a far departure from what we're working with today, considering that when you're working with rows and tables in MySQL, you're forming based off of a primary key. Your primary key gets you to your record. Your record allows you to gain access to your non-primary key columns. So here, we have a key uh, which has your explicitly defined primary key in combination with some internal metadata, and then that points to your non-primary key columns. So it is different when you get down to the actual storage and how you process this data but at a high logical level, it's not a vast departure from anything we're already currently working with. Now, when this does start to deviate is when we start talking about how this data is logically organized. Now, when we're talking with MySQL, we're commonly talking about tables, columns, rows, and a lot of that stays the same when we're working with MyRox, but there is one additional scope, and that's when we start to introduce column families. Now, when you have your create table statement, you usually have your primary key column down here, or you can actually make reference to secondary keys. And at the end, you can comment. And what happens here is MyRox interprets your comment as your column family. So you can have multiple clustered index and non-clustered indexes grouped together in column families. You can keep them apart. 
But what, what's really important about this is that this changes your configuration scope. So up until now, you've been looking mainly at global variables for, for server configuration and session variables, but now we also have column family options. So you can actually specify different memory caches and different configurations specific to each column family. So as you group things together, this is something that you're going to be, have to be like very, very aware of. And we're gonna point out a few key reasons why as we work our way through the presentation. So ultimately, what, what's our objective? What are we trying to do here? So in a log structured format, what we're trying to do is get a series of data files that are all grouped together, that are reasonable in size, and that don't overlap and never change because our data never changes today, right? This is still 1994. We have static web content and nobody is actually doing anything with transactional data, right? That's, that's where we're at. So how we get here is the interesting point. So first off, we have our log structured data changes. As you work with uh, records, you're gonna say, hey, I'm inserting this value. I'm updating a value, I'm deleting it, I'm inserting again. And all of this flows through into memory in a space called an active mem table. Now this mem table by default is usually about 64 megs in size, and as data is being written to it, at the same time, information about your data changes are also being synchronized to a write-ahead log. Now if you're familiar with Postgres, this is not a new term for you. If, you are, if, uh, if you're more of a MySQL person, you can think of this to be more of like the InnoDB redo log, and this is mainly for durability and crash recovery. So if you're in the middle of writing to your memory space and your MySQL instance crashes and it comes back up, it's gonna leverage these write-ahead logs in order to rebuild the changes that were written into memory in your active mem table space. So this continues on until the mem table fills up. Like I said, it's roughly about 64 megs. Once it fills up, it says, okay, we're done. We're gonna make this memory space completely immutable. Nothing can change. We're gonna form a new mem table that new data changes can be written to. Once this space becomes immutable, it says, okay, we're gonna take all of this as it is, and we're gonna write it down into persistent space, and this is where we create our first data file that we, talk, we were talking about earlier. Every time this flush occurs, we get a new write-ahead log. So both of these are flushing in sync with one another. Now, one other very, very important point to make about this flushing process is that deduplication is actually part of getting data from memory into disk. Now we were talking about how this is log structured. So every single change that you make to a value by inserting, updating, doing more updates, deleting it, inserting it again, you don't need all of these records. You only need to represent the current state of your data at the time that it gets flushed to disk. And that's why we have a deduplication process as part of the engine in that flushing process. Because like in this example, in our inverted watermelon, we uh, have our one value which represents everything that occurred within this timeline, and that's what gets sent down to storage. So first off, does anybody have any questions about that process before we get into configuration? Maybe you'll get to it, but I was just wondering sure. how transactions uh, come into play. With transactions really would be better to be discussed when we get into compaction, but we will get there. Okay. Yes. Thanks. So the, before the mem table becomes immutable, mm -hmm. I assume it's not purely log structured cat only, is that right? You can update things that are in that part of, like records that are really fresh could be overwritten if you wanted to. Right, so take this example, right? So it, it is log structured when it sits in active memory. So you have your first value, you've inserted it, then you've updated it. Both of these events are actually stored. It is log structured. Okay. So, so it, when, when you say before it's immutable, it's mutable, but it's concatenate only. Right, yes. Oh, and the other thing, uh, maybe it's a better ask later, but I'll mm -hmm. throw it out. I would be interested in why the index matters. Uh, why index number matters instead? Shouldn't the key be enough? Um, so when you create a table, um, everything Despite the fact that you're grouping by column families, you still need to have reference to your index, be it your clustered index or a secondary index, because you can have multiple of these that can belong to column families. So when you go back and you reference, for example, if, you have, uh, if you're reading from a secondary key in your table, it's gonna start by leveraging that secondary index, and that's gonna say, hey, 
the primary value for this, and the clustered index has this index ID and this primary key, and this is where you go to find uh, the actual full record. Okay. Okay. James. Hi. I, I do have one, and it's uh, it's the stupid noob question: Is what's the engineering problem MyRox is trying to solve that InnoDB can't? Okay. So that that we are actually going to cover use cases towards the end. Uh, sorry, I should have asked. Like we're just asking questions about this particular subject. I promise there is much, much more to come. The the the, the talk is much longer than that. But yeah, we'll we'll talk about uh, use cases here towards the end. So when it comes to configuring this particular mechanism, the first thing that you can do is for each column family, you can specify your write buffer size. Now, we originally said that your active mem table space is 64 megs. This is changeable. Another option you have is your minimum write buffer number to merge. So we talked about having one active mem table. One active mem table becomes one immutable mem table. The new active mem table is being written to while the immutable mem table is being flushed to disk. This is something that can actually be changed. You can say, hey, instead of waiting for one immutable mem table, let's wait for four or eight. And one of the advantages to this is that if you're writing, uh, if you're writing use cases very spiky in nature, you can say, hey, I want to have more stuff stored in memory before we actually start flushing to disk. The downside to this is that if you have a large amount of data and memory and that flush process occurs, if that 64 meg active mem table fills up while the flush is still ongoing, writing for that column family will stop. So my recommendation, if you haven't messed around with the metrics that are associated with this, or uh, you know, viewed more information about the storage engine in your particular use case, is to leave this at one. That way you make sure that the system has enough time to flush that small amount of data before your active mem table fills up. So uh, one other thing you may have noticed is that we have many different column families that we can employ. Each column family has its active mem table, so it can have a mutable mem table. So unless you're really paying attention, uh, you could actually run into a situation where you're using an excessive amount of memory, um, despite your best efforts to you know, try to keep an eye on managing your system. This variable is global in scope, uh, it rocks to be uh, right buffer size, and this basically says that this is the maximum limit for your active mem tables across all of your column families. If you actually reach this threshold, it's going to pick one of your mem tables, usually one of, uh, one of the active mem tables, usually one of the largest, and it's gonna start the process of rotation, and then it's gonna start flushing in order to ensure that you don't hit an upper memory boundary. And this is basically there as a safeguard to make sure that you don't oom. You also have a total space for your write ahead logs. If you hit this, basically what it's gonna do is it's gonna convert all active mem tables at that point to immutable, it's gonna start flushing. That way it can start to purge out old write ahead logs. Generally, I would recommend not touching this at all as disk space usually is not that big of an issue these days. Uh, and honestly, having everything flushing from memory space to disk at once may not necessarily uh, end well for you. So now you know what you can change. How can you tell uh, what changes were effective? And uh, people will get a copy of these slides. I know this is a lot of information all at once. Uh, here, you can actually see how much memory is being used by your mem tables. Remember I was telling you about how if you have not flushed disk prior to your active mem table filling up, you can get slowdowns, you can get stops. This is tell, can tell you right here if that's occurring. Uh, at the global level, or I'm sorry, rather at the column family level, you can tell per column family how much uh, memory space is being used for your active mem tables, uh, the number of records that are there, uh, and the number of immutable mem tables that are available. Now there are tons more. I think there's about 30 of them that are mentioned in my blog post for this particular mechanic alone. But if you're going to try to implement RocksDB in your system uh, via MySQL, these are the ones that are absolutely 100% essential. Always make sure that you have an upper bound for memory. Make sure you have some awareness of what's going on in memory space, specifically for those writes as they start to come in, because this is a write-optimized system. So keeping track of these metrics is going to be very, very important for you. So once we actually get past that initial flush, uh, we actually get into this thing called compaction. So your first writes end up up here, and then the data gets reorganized through write, uh, basically using um, deferred write amplification. Uh, 
to slowly make, uh, make its way down the LSM tree, and I'm gonna describe this in a lot more data, but ultimately this is what sorts out your data, this is what deduplicates, this is what allows things to not overlap, so on and so forth. But it's really, re it's re easier to explain this with an example. Let's go back to where we left off. So we have our immutable mem tables. Uh, we can say this one is using key values 100 through 250, zero to 150. Uh, they are immutable now, they're ready to be flushed to disk. The only thing that the process is gonna do is move it into what we call the L0 compaction layer, which is at the very top of your LSM tree. It writes it verbatim, less the deduplication process. Once these files have been moved from memory to disk, eventually you will have so much data at this layer, it's gonna say, okay, well, we've hit an upper bound for what we want at this level, and now what we need to do is compact our data. A compaction thread is now spawned and says, I'm ready to go. In this example, it's saying we're gonna start at this file right here, which is holding values zero through 150. Well, in order to compact it down to the next level, it needs to find the files in the next compaction level down, which overlap with this. So we have zero to 150 here, so we're gonna to need to grab information from zero to 100, and then 101 to 200, to make sure that we can create a new table, or rather a new file where nothing overlaps. So it's gonna read data from these three files. It's going to sort them. It's going to merge them. It's going to deduplicate. And it's gonna create a new file here consisting of records, or keys rather, zero to 200, right? Once this is done, it says, hey, I don't need you guys anymore. We're 100% done. We have a new file that represents the data that was in these files, and it then deletes them. So this is basically what causes deferred write amplification. Let's go back to that first slide for a moment. So in this first layer, data is disorganized, right? We have active mem or immutable mem tables. This one has 100 to 250. This one has 0 to 150. But ultimately the point here is to be able to have a write optimized system. We need to get this to disk as quickly as possible. We don't need to worry about page splitting. We don't wanna worry about the ordering of a clustered index in NODB or something else that's optimized for B-tree. We just want to get the data to disk as quickly as possible. So let's write that. But we still have our objective, which is to get a series of files where we have our key records where they're not overlapping. So we can say, hey, if I wanna find something that's zero to 100, I don't have to go through two files. I only wanna to go to one. I wanna speed up that lookup, right? So that's why we go through this process of organizing this data and reading it through to make sure that it can become organized and then eventually meet our objective where we have two files in this compaction layer which have more or less met our objective. Now the one thing to point out uh, before we get too much further, going back to that first slide again. Actually, we'll go to the third. This one's a little bit better. So we have data up here that does overlap. There's a, a slight problem when it comes to taking overlapping data and making sure that it doesn't overlap, and that's that you can really only have one thread at a time that does this, at least for this layer. The reason being is if you have multiple threads, you have one that's saying, okay, well, I, I have, I, I've read this file, I have zero through 150, and I've got another thread over here, and what, what do you have? Okay, the files that you need to access down here, are they gonna conflict with what I have going on? It's a lot to manage within memory space and within the logic of your code. So instead, this first compaction from L0 to L1 is single-threaded. But that changes as we get through and our, our compaction layers get larger and larger and larger, and this is unfortunately not a really great diagram because it actually grows by 10 times per layer, not you know, additional like 20%. Uh, and then eventually we get down to our lowest levels where we have nice, small, clean files, nothing overlaps, data super easy to read. Um, so does anybody have any questions about that mechanic or what it is we're trying to achieve through this exercise? Yes, sir. Just going back to a slide or two where you had the yep. one going from to 150 and the other one, okay. Um, how does it know where to do the split for L1? So, I mean, zero to 100, I imagine that's totally arbitrary. Is that done based on the size of the indices or on the size of the data or 
where does it make a decision on how many of those bottom levels to, to make out of the top level? Sure. So the decision is actually made at the top. So when compaction is spawned, it's spawned based off of the trigger at L0 that basically says I have too many files or my compaction layer is too big. So it has to start there. And there's actually a, a very, very, very lengthy document that actually goes into the algorithm of how these files are selected. To be perfectly honest, I didn't read it to, uh, to that much of an extent. Uh, it does have to do, uh, from what I understand, it does have a little bit to do with size. It does have a little bit to do with indices, but there's a lot more to it. So I, I, I can get you the link to that document. Um, but yeah, so it starts there. And since it knows it has keys 0 through 150, it knows it has to grab all the files down at the next level that overlap with that. So that can merge all that together and create a new file here. Does that help? Cool. James. The 0 to 150 file is written next. How does compaction know that it needs instead to go to the 100 to 250 to begin pulling in the historical data first? Sure. So part of the metadata of each key value is a timestamp. So it actually stores all that information so it knows historically what came before that. So it can actually use that data during compaction to find out, hey, which one of these records actually happened, you know, which one of these changes happened before the other. And that's why, it, I mean, that's why the term log structure comes into play. Sure, go for it. Yep. So then in terms of get memory out as quick as possible, write optimized, how bad of a scenario is it for a query to come along that wants to read file that is in the compaction process, but it hasn't finished going through? So when you're reading, um, and actually, I'm sorry, somebody else asked about transactions. I, I'll discuss that as well. So um, when you're grabbing a transaction and you're accessing records that are being held in an SST file, which is candidate for compaction, it depends on what part of the compaction process you're in. Now, when you're establishing a lock on that key, uh, if compaction starts, it'll actually say, hey, don't, pack, don't compact this file. There are other scenarios where you can have SST files which are being read from as compaction is ongoing, and it just simply won't delete the file at the end. Um, here we go. And let's say compaction says, hey, I've got record zero to 100, but hey, MVCC has some you know, lock on that in order to make sure that I can have repeatable read or something like that. Um, it's basically gonna say, hey, you're done, you're compacted, the new file is, is created, and read processes will know that this is here because this is gonna be tombstoned, but it has to wait for that transaction to be released before then another cleanup thread will come through, find files that are ready for deletion and actually delete them. So just because they're in this process doesn't mean you can't read them. Correct. Things get complicated. Yes. Like I said, super, super high level. The, uh, the, uh, the processes for cleaning up old files and compaction for writing new files, they're actually separate. So when does compaction happen? So we were talking about how data goes through a mutable space and then gets written to L0. And then we talked about how L0 is going to become large enough that it's going to say, hey, I need to compact down, get data down to the lower <coughs> level. So for L0, the default number of files is four. Now you'll note uh, in parentheses I have it, uh, it says 256 megs max. Each active mem table is going to hold up to 64 megs of data, assuming you don't change the configuration. Deduplication, depending on how often you're updating the same record, I, in some of my cases in Sysbench, I've had 64 megs in memory, but then it only comes down to two megs in disk, right? So you have to know that the upper bound is a 256 meg potential, but deduplication can make that a lot smaller. When you get down to L1, this is where we change from file numbers to size across the compaction, uh, the compaction level. And this is where we get to 256 megs by default. And then you have the max bytes for level multiplier, which is 10, meaning we have L1 at 256 megs, and then it just goes up by 10 times all the way until you get to your lowest, or what they say, bottommost compaction layer uh, at L6 at roughly about 25 terabytes. And you can also specify per column family, 
uh, how many compaction layers you want. Um, Seven is uh, the one that's set by default. One thing that I've had people ask me a lot is, why do we have seven compaction layers? And, and to be perfectly transparent, I, I don't have a very good answer for that. It is recommended by the people at MyRocks and RocksDB. Technically, I think you can get away, I mean, if you have a really, really small data set, you might be able to get away with something as small as three. One to get your, uh, level zero to get your data into disk, level one to get it reorganized into a non-overlapping structure and then three for longer term storage, but uh, they're saying that seven levels appears to give you uh, the best performance. Uh, so another thing to address is file size. I mean, if you're, if you're familiar with Cassandra, you're, this isn't gonna be that foreign to you. It uses compaction and LSM trees and all that stuff as well, but its files become larger. Where with RocksDB, uh, they have a tendency to stay roughly about the same size. So uh, you have your size of your uh, files in L1, and then basically you have a multiplier here, which is 64 megs by one respectively, meaning that all files across all compaction layers will be 64 megs. I really wouldn't be inclined to mess with this a whole lot, unless you have an absolutely gargantuan amount of data. Uh, for me, and, and keep in mind, this is purely theoretical, but I would be disinclined to change this largely because the larger the data file, the more the compaction process has to do. That's gonna be somewhat resource intensive given the fact that you know, the whole point of this is deferred write amplification. So I find that prob probably using smaller files is gonna work better for you to make sure that process doesn't run amok, doesn't take forever, and doesn't slow down compaction at a higher level. Uh, RocksDB max background jobs. This one's super, super important. One thing that sets RocksDB apart from other log structured merge indexes is the fact that it's multi-threaded. With the exception of L0 to L1, uh, you can have multiple threads running compaction. You can have multiple threads flushing from memory to disk. Um, the default here is two. Really interesting thing about that is that this actually used to be two variables. You actually got to specify how many threads you wanted for that initial flush, flush from immutable mem tables to disk, and then however many threads you wanted for compaction. Uh, in the most recent versions, they've combined this into a single variable, and the reason why it's two is to ensure that you always have uh, one thread for uh, flushing to disk initially, and then another thread for compaction. Now, given the fact that these are dedicated resources, it is possible you could have them both dedicated to flushing or both dedicated to compaction, but I think it does have some logic in there to block that from happening, but I haven't been able to do enough uh, testing to sufficiently prove that. But uh, again, uh, my thought would be if, if you have the option and if you have enough CPU cores and enough physical memory or, or enough physical resources at your disposal, I would be very, very inclined to increase that. Uh, max subcompactions. This is another super, super important variable. The reason being is again, L0 to L1, single threaded. But you do have subcompaction threads that are responsible for individual parts of the sort process, the merge process, deduplication. So you can assign subcompaction threads to help parallelize that job and make it run a lot faster. So if you're seeing uh, evidence in your metrics to uh, basically state that you are getting stalls or write stops due to issues where L0 can't compact to L1, definitely keep an eye on this. You're going to want to make sure it's, it's bigger than one. And here's how you get some visibility into compaction. Uh, so we were just talking about uh, stalls at level zero to level one. So here's uh, something in uh, show global status where you can get information on that. Uh, for your information schema, for your uh, column family statistics, you can get a lot of information for uh, the number of pending compactions. But uh, the one I really wanted to point out is in the information schema, you actually have tables, several of them, that are dedicated to giving you visibility into compaction because that's what RocksDB and MyRocks is really all about. It's this whole process. This, it's the deference of right amplification. So uh, I would highly recommend that if you do use this, you become familiar with these so you know what's compacted, what's pending to be compacted, uh, what, what indexes are assigned to my tables, you know, what files are assigned to those indexes. This gives you all the visibility you need to make sure that your system is running optimally. Uh, any other questions about compaction before we move on to the next topic? Sir? Uh, okay, so that's actually a good question. Uh, there is, um, I don't know if it uses async I.O. I know it doesn't use a lot of direct I.O. Uh, 
which I know is something that they're currently doing a lot of investigation into because you'd think that given the fact that you have a compaction process, once it goes through deduplication, the write process is going to be serial in nature. You'd think that direct I.O. would be a better use case for that. But I believe that in most cases it uses fsync. In some cases it uses fdatasync. Um, so yeah, um, not something that was in the slides, but yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that they'll give us more direct I.O. options in the future. Uh, so, sorry, any other questions? Sir. Uh, close enough. Uh, given the last slide where you said that there was the, um, where it's already writing some of these schema tables that give you the information you need based on performance, mm -hmm. do you foresee that there could actually be some kind of automation tool that will scan that and come up with optimal settings for those, for the variables you were talking about before? Possible, yes. Likely, probably not. Um, the reason being is a lot of people have asked the exact same question for NODB configuration. Because, I mean, there's, there's a plethora of information out there, either looking at metrics that have been made available through PMM, show engine NODB status, show global variables. There's tons of info about NODB out there, and people have proposed it's like, well, if you set up something that uh, monitors this process, then obviously you could have it respond intelligently to uh, NODB and reconfigure it on the fly. Uh, by, based on what dynamic variables are, avail are available and uh, reconfigure it. But those tools really don't exist. I mean, even when you look at databases as service stuff like RDS and Aurora, you have pre-configured uh, configurations, but it's not being changed all that much on the fly. So it's possible. Somebody might do it. And given the fact that it's being employed in so many different products, that increases the possibility in my opinion, but it's still, it's hard to tell. So one problem with compaction, we have multiple copies of our data, possibly as many as seven. Um, and obviously each compaction layer is one tenth the size of the one that comes beneath it. So if you have a data set size of 25 terabytes, you have probably about 3.5-ish terabytes of space where your data is being duplicated. So how can we better manage this? How can we speed this up? Because obviously if a read process, we're dealing with log structured data, it has timestamps available in it. So we need to be able to find the most recent version of that data, and we need to be able to find it quickly. So there's two things that MyRox slash RoxDB employs to make this better. First is compression, and the second is bloom filters. Now, uh, if you're familiar with a bloom filter, would you raise your hand, please? Okay, so we'll go over this really, really quick. Uh, a bloom filter is a space-efficient way of determining set membership. So let's say we have three pieces of information that we have in our set. We have X, Y, and Z. The way a bloom filter works, and this is a really, 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 really simplified version of a bloom filter. What you're gonna start with is a array of zeros uh, to start with. You're gonna have a value. That value is gonna get hashed. Um, think of something along the lines of a very, very, very short form hash. And it's basically gonna say, hey, well, if I'm inserting X, the output of that one way hash is to say, okay, we'll toggle uh, values here, here, and here. If I'm going to insert Y, we're going to insert here, here, and here. And if we have Z, we're going to toggle to one uh, uh, here, here, uh, and uh, over here. So with this one, we have a hash. It outputs three values and basically says, turn this on. So somebody goes in and says, hey, is W part of this set? Well, when we put W through the one-way hash, we check here, here, and here. Now we're looking for ones, and there's a zero here. So that means, based off of the output of the one-way hash, this W is definitely not in this set. But we know that hash collisions are a reality, especially when we're dealing with short-form hashes. We're not talking about MD5, because that would be a ridiculous amount of space to kind of store any potential value with the output of MD5. But um, since we have hash collisions as a likelihood, it can tell you that something is definitely not in a set but can only tell you if maybe something is in a set. And based on the a way that you configure your bloom filters, the number of arrays you use, because in, in more complex bloom filters, you can use uh, more than one array. You can use more than one hash algorithm. And the complexities can get quite large. The more complex it is, uh, the more you reduce your likelihood of getting false positives, so on and so forth. But the point is, is just to look at it and say, hey, I've got this W. Is this W in this set? No, great, now I know I don't know. Don't have to look here. When you have multiple copies of your data and multiple files, you can see where this is gonna get handy for you real quick. So 
The only thing that you need to know is that configuring Bloom filtering for RocksDB and MyRox is not exactly transparent. If you plan on using this, I do highly recommend you check my uh, blog post or download this slide because you have to make reference to the column family options. And for your column family, you have to make reference to your uh, block-based table factory, which is skip list in this case. And then you have to designate your filter policy, policy and how many bits you want for every key and whether you want that to be at the file or whether you want that to be in a subset or prefixed or something like that. It gets complicated very, very, very quickly. This is uh, the, the default, uh, sorry, not the default, this is one of the uh, common configurations. I've seen this noted in uh, Mark Callahan, Callahan's blog several times. Uh, so again, just remember, it, it's, it's pretty far from intuitive. Make sure you read up on it before you try to, uh, try to use it. Concept is simple. For some reason, they couldn't make that simple. Um, so your status variables. RocksDB uh, Bloom filter useful. How many times did I check a Bloom filter and find that I was able to invalidate set membership right off the bat. You can compare this against other uh, status variables that are common in MySQL. Com select, for example. How many times did I select? How many times did I find that a, use, a Bloom filter was useful? How many rows did I read? How many times did I see a, a Bloom filter was useful? So you can compare this against a lot of things in order to determine your Bloom filter hit ratio, and then you can adjust your Bloom filter bits per key or whatever, however you would like. So another option we have is compression. And there's different, uh, several different forms of compression that are supported in rocks. Uh, you can see them all listed there. A very easy way to tell uh, what's currently supported in your instance of Percona is just by going out to uh, uh, the log file that's in your RocksDB data directory and uh, just saying, hey, grep compression algorithm supported. Get the next 10 lines and it'll tell you, hey, you have this installed, you have that installed. Uh, very, very quick look up in case you're not wanting to dig through your operating system. Uh, and compression is actually one of the key features that draws people to MyRox and RocksDB. Uh, it compresses up to four times better than InnoDB and compressed, and it compresses more than twice as well as uh, InnoDB compressed. And this is where things get uh, really, really interesting considering the fact that it compresses so much more, but there's so much less of a performance impact uh, I, I know there's a lot of Postgres people here. I, know, I don't know how many people are familiar with InnoDB or InnoDB compression, but when you compress with InnoDB, you do take a noteworthy performance hit, and you don't get that here so long as your use case is fitting for this, and we're gonna cover that towards the end of the presentation. So uh, another great thing about compression is that compression can be configured for every column family. It can be configured for each compaction layer. So one thing that's very common is to not compress at the very top of your LSM tree for L0 and L1 because you're trying to reorganize your data. It's single threaded. You don't want it to have to do anything it doesn't necessarily have to do in order to facilitate that initial compaction. But then as you get down into L2, L3, L4, further down you're gonna to wanna to start employing some compression and then when you get all the way down to your lowest or bottom most compaction level, uh, you should definitely use some some, uh, some really, really good compression there because that's the data that's not going to be as frequently used uh, in theory. So um, when it comes to uh, your compression configuration, it gives you three options, two of which I find to be entirely useless. Um, it, you can specify, I want compression, and this says, hey, I'm gonna apply this compression algorithm across my entire column family. Uh, you can say, hey, I want my bottom most compression to be, uh, my bottom most uh, uh, compaction layer to be compressed using this. Personally, I don't like either of these. Uh, it actually gives you an option for compression per level, and there you can provide a delimited list of compression uh, algorithms that you want to use, and the order in which it's read is the in order in which it will be applied to your compaction layer. So for example, uh, you can see for compression per level, uh, our first two are no compression, don't compress L0 or L1. Please, please do this, please. Um, <laughs> then we have uh, LZ4 compression for everything, and then we get down to KZST when we get down to our bottom most layer. Uh, again, not the most uh, intuitive thing to configure, uh, so do come back, check the slides, check the blog post. It's all there, I promise you. And now a word. So, um, Deviating away from the content about RocksDB and MyRox, I do want to talk about a fairly serious issue. Capacity planning for databases is difficult. This is nothing new. 
Our data sets are growing all the time, and there are points where we can feel very, very pressured to make very bad decisions when our disks are running out of space. Um, I have seen people employ non-standard storage engines to look at non-standard data solutions when they're under duress when a disk is about to run out of space. When you do this, uh, the, the monster is going to eat the kitty. Don't, don't, don't do this because I've, uh, generally if you don't take into consideration all of the features and limitations of your storage engine, you can run into a bad time and I've seen that bad time happen. I've seen it happen a couple of times now. So always make sure you're taking all of the features and all of the limitations into consideration of your storage engine prior to employing it for your production use case, please. So now we know about how data gets into RocksDB. You know, we have uh, the memory space and it flushes down and then it compacts and applies compression and applies bloom filters. But how does data get back out? So we have our read request starting here. And the first thing it's gonna do, it's gonna check something called the block cache. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with NoDB, this is gonna be like your NoDB buffer pool. It's its own set of memory. Um, it is dedicated purely to reads. So any data that's found on disk will be pulled into memory, it will be pulled into this space, uh, and then it will be sent up to higher levels of the database in order to support the, uh, the read process. So the process goes, hey, I'm looking for a record. Is it already in memory? Has it been invalidated by another write process? No, I, it's there, great, fine. Go through and uh, send the uh, send the results to the, uh, to the upper levels of MySQL. Uh, okay, so it's not in here. Okay, let's check our mem tables. That's where the most recent data is, right? We, we're not interested in data that's a year old. We wanna know what the value of the record is right now. So let's start with memory, right? Is it there? Mm, okay, well, yes, great. Okay, then load that into the block cache and send it out, okay? But what if it's not there? Then we get down to our persistent disk space. And this is where things get a little bit more interesting. Let's go back to compaction. So it's gonna start at the highest level of compaction, which is L0, and it's gonna say, hey, I'm a read process, and I wanna find read based off of key 200. Well, okay, well, I've got a couple files. They're not in any particular order, but I do have a file that has uh, range 100 through 250, so maybe it's there. I have this other one that's zero to 150, so we know it's not there based off of range, so we've invalidated that file right off the bat. So it's gonna check this file, and then if you have bloom filtering enabled, it's gonna pull the full bloom filter for this file down into the block cache. It's gonna check for set membership, and it's gonna ask, okay, well, is this in, in the SST? Maybe, no, okay, well, maybe it is. Let's go ahead and read from it. If not, we invalidate, and then we move on to the next compaction layer. So the, the process basically goes, hey, uh, we've checked the block cache, we've checked uh, our mem tables, we've gone through the first compaction layer, it wasn't there, checked the files using the same process in L1, wasn't there, checked L2, oh, we found our data, loaded the block cache and then sent it to MySQL so it can become part of your results set. Um, any, much simpler than the right process. Does anybody have any questions about reads? Yes, sir. Long walk back to the microphone. Sorry about that. It sounds like very expensive if it's not going to find it at all. Yep. Is, is there a way that you avoid searches that are not going to succeed? Well, I mean, unfortunately, when you're looking for data, and this is really the same for any real, you know, any database that, that deals with persistent storage. I mean, you always have to check is in memory. And if not, then you always have to go to disk, right? Um, so RocksDB is going to suffer. Uh, from some read degradation if it has to check all seven layers and then determine that it's not there. The process is actually pretty quick. And we're gonna talk about that just a little bit in our use cases, but you do make a very valid point. Uh, so if you do a lot of data reads for stuff where you may need to invalidate faster than having to check in seven different places, obviously bloom filters are a great friend. Uh, if not, then you, you may actually be better off with a B tree. Um, so for, sorry, sir. Is there a problem here with like really long reads? I mean, like reads that take half an hour, for example. Or, or is there any locking issues? Or is there like... So the blocking, uh, this kind of comes back to what we were talking about earlier with compaction. 
Mm -hmm. So if you have a really, really long read where you actually have uh, your isolation level set to something like repeat, uh, repeatable read, mm -hmm. obviously it needs to keep track of what the values are at the time that the transaction occurred. Keep in mind, we do have metadata for when data changes were there, but if you're reading from data on disk, mm -hmm. then obviously it knows that, hey, compaction can't happen for certain files or we can't delete them. And that's where your problems can occur. But beyond that, I mean, for just looking at standard, hey, I've got a long read, it, it's really about the same as it is for most other storage engines. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, Bjorn. Can I deliberately read old data? Can I say, give me all the versions that you have on disk? I was curious about that. I've read into it. I was not able to find that feature. Doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but I'm more inclined to say no. Uh, no, I mean, uh, MySQL dump op operates within a transaction. This is this supports transactions. So yes, I, absolutely, you can get MySQL dump. But you just asked. No, no, he was asking specifically, hey, can I say I don't want to get the current version of the record. I want to get something from a specific oh, date and time. Right, and you know, there's actually a feature for that. Um, God, I want to say it's MariaDB. This is right off the top of my head. Thanks, Bjorn. Uh, where you can actually uh, have tables that are configured to actually keep track of history, uh, but it's not. It's not rocks. It's, it's a different engine. I think it's in ODB, and it's a special feature that's, I want to say that's MariaDB exclusive. Don't quote me on that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but yes, sorry, was there any other questions before I ramble further? OK, so uh, configuration. Your block cache size is where your reads happen. It's configured to half a gig. Um, again, once again, anybody who's familiar with NODB is going to know that for some reason, uh, MySQL really, really likes to go with small read caches right off the bat. Um, I don't remember the last time I looked at a production system that had less than 16 gigs of memory. And I mean, that's a small, <coughs> small instance right there on its own. This is not going to serve you that well. So you're going to need to increase this as part of your base configuration. But there's a huge but. Um, when you're talking about NODB, the buffer pool serves writing and reading, right? In this case, those processes are separate. You have your own memory caches for writing, and you have your own memory caches now for reading. So normally, when if you were working with an ODB, you'd want to set your buffer pool to something like 80%, 85%, depending upon the amount of physical memory you have. In this case, you're going to want to start a little bit smaller to make sure that you have room for your mem tables, uh, active and immutable, right? So uh, there's more information in my blog post on how to calculate how much space you're going to need for your mem tables. Please take that into consideration. But do know that you're going to have to take this above the default value of half gig. Um, your SIM cache size. I love this feature. I love this feature so much. In fact, if you pay attention to absolutely nothing else, I've said this entire hour, please pay attention to this, because this is very, very interesting. Here's a problem. I'm working with MySQL. I'm working with NODB. I have um, 16 gigs of memory. I've configured eight gigs of uh, memory for my NODB buffer pool. I check show engine NODB status, and I see that I have 800 hits out of 1,000 reads are hitting my buffer pool, which means I'm having to go to disk fairly often in order to get the data that I need. My active data set does not fit in memory. So how do I determine how much larger my buffer pool has to be? You think maybe it needs to be 20% bigger because you have 800 hits out of 1,000, but that's not always necessarily true, right? So usually it's a lot of trial and error. I'm going to make it bigger. I'm going to add more system memory. Or vice versa, you have a situation where you have 128 gigs of memory in your phys physical in your box, right? And you have a 100 gig NODB buffer pool, and it's hitting 1,000 out of 1,000. And you think, well, maybe this is too big for my active data set. Maybe I can shrink that down and make room for something else. But how big does that have to be? In that case, you're completely out of luck because there's no stat out there that's going to help you until now. <laughs> so for, for my rocks, you have the simulation cache. Let's say your block cache size is 50 gigs. Easy math, right? Um, you're, not, you're hitting a statistic. You want to grow it. You want to shrink it. But you don't know what. You can actually employ a simulation cache. It doesn't hold data. What it does is it holds keys, and only keys. What information would be in there, and how big would it have been, thus simulating the size of your block cache. So I can say, hey, my block cache is 50 gigs. What would happen if I made it 60? Now I can make it 60, and the guesswork is gone. 
This is, this for me is like, this is where I start to nerd out quite a little bit because this is a challenge that we face when we're configuring systems. And now the guesswork is completely gone. Uh, th there is one little gotcha with the SIM cache and that's there's only one place you can read inform information for it and that's in show engine rocks DB status. Every other stat that you're ever going to want to know is available through show global status. This is the only place where you actually have to dig through massive walls of text to find the information you need. But again, I find this to make uh, management much, much easier. From people who are actually looking at usage of the engine, they may not necessarily care about this because this is something they may only have to look at once or twice a year. But man, I always love it when I have something that takes away guesswork. So um, let's talk again about our visibility and how well this is working. We have our block cache hit ratio, uh, which basically tells you, hey, uh, how often, if, by comparing these variables, how often is my block cache getting hit? Uh, do I need to make it larger? Do I need to pull up my simulation cache and run some tests and find out uh, how, how much larger it needs to be? Um, another really interesting uh, metric is your L1, uh, L0, and L2 and up hits. So I wasn't able to pull it from memory. Was I able to get it from L0? Did I have to go to L1? Did I have to go even further than that? And this can tell you a lot about the size of your active data set because you have a little bit of data at L0, a little bit more at L1, a little bit more at L2. So how far did it have to go? Maybe you should resize your compaction layers in order to make sure you're fitting more up top, right? So this is gonna give you a little bit more visibility and help you configure uh, how the whole LSM tree is shaped. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, once again, I wanted to talk about those two entries in uh, Show Engine Rocks TV status so you can get information about uh, the simulation cache. Um, so before we get into use case considerations, does anybody have questions about any of the configuration or metric points that we just talked about? Good, awesome. So great, now we know how it works at a very, very high level. We are now all experts at my rocks. Congratulations, you have graduated this course, but now how do I know whether this is something I really even wanna try? So let's, let's take all this technical nonsense and find out when I actually wanna consider using this. So first off is compression. If you have a very, very large data set and you'd like to make it a not very large data set, this is actually a good solution for you. But hey, remember, we don't, we don't use storage engines based solely on compression. We, we consider everything, right? That, that's the big lesson, one of the big lessons we take away today. There is more to an engine about compression. Don't let the monster eat the kitty. We don't like that. <laughs> uh, right optimized. The whole point of an LSM tree is deferred right amplification. When you have NODB, you write data, and it wants to optimize it on disk as soon as possible to make sure that it's optimized for reads ASAP. There's a lot of overhead, especially with your table checkpointing, to make sure that this can be facilitated. My rocks, get the stuff on disk and figure it out later, right? We're gonna have to have multiple copies to support that, but this is where your gains come into play. I love this graph. This, so this, this is a graph that was made by Vadim Kachenko over at Percona. Uh, this is uh, one of his many performance blogs, uh, this one being on my rocks. And this jitter graph uh, is basically showing transaction throughput based on the size of active data set versus the amount of physical memory on the system. So we have, an, uh, we have a small amount of memory, and ODB doesn't really seem to, do, to work all that well, right? Uh, it's having to swap a lot of information in and out of disk, and it's not optimized for that. So my rock seems to perform consistently as the memory increases. So if your active data set is larger than your amount of physical memory in your machine, and you don't want to spend the amount of money to scale vertically, this is an option that can work for you, right? But as you can see, when you start getting into uh, lots and lots and lots of memory, you can see that NODB can outperform my rocks. So if you have a small active data set, NODB may still work for you. Make sure that you test this before you employ. Backups, now up until a couple of weeks ago, this was a very different story. So uh, a while back, Percona supported TokoDB, and they still do, it's not deprecated yet. But one of the big problems was that if you had TokoDB installed and if you were using InnoDB, and if they were on the same MySQL instance, you had a serious problem with your backups. You couldn't have any kind of backup with assured data consistency across both engines because there was no way to go across the platform and say, hey, start your transactions for each engine now. 
right, and now get me a copy of my data. It just couldn't happen. They just didn't support one another that way. Uh, up until very recently, that was the same thing for my rocks. You were basically going to have to flush tables with read locks or stop your instance entirely and then take a snapshot in order to assure consistency. But we have good news. Uh, 8.0.6 for extra backup is being released with support for both NODB and MyRox. Another really important thing to note about this, and probably one of the main driving reasons why they tried to make this happen in the first place, is in MySQL 8.0, we now have a data dictionary that actually exists in the database. Like, if you guys know MySQL, you know you have FRM files on disk. This is, this is what drives your data dictionary. That's done now. 8.0, you don't have those files anymore. It's all actually being stored. It's being stored in NODB. So in order to actually have a backup that preserves your data dictionary and your data, this has to happen in MySQL 8.0. So now if you have MyRox and NODB in the same system, which, I mean, you could argue back and forth all day whether that's a good idea or not. Um, but hey, at least you have the option for backups now where with other systems, you may not have had that option. Um, so. Let's talk a bit about our disadvantages. And this one's kind of tricky. So range lookups, we're talking about keys. Uh, we're talking about log structure merge. And more often than not, your common verbs when it comes to working with a key value store is put, delete, get. Add some information to the log, delete information from the log via tombstone processes more often than not, and get information from, uh, from the log, right? When we're talking about RocksDB, this changes, but slightly. The verb uh, get changes to scan. So most key value stores are optimized to work with get a key, load it into memory, give it to the user, right? You're always having to reference specific to the key. And when we're talking about MySQL, the way that might look is select uh, columns from table where primary key equals value. Uh, and you have to use a const operator of equals in this case to make it work the same way. Things change a lot when we go from select column from table where primary key be, uh, between x and y. Right now we've changed it to range. And a lot of key value stores are not optimized for that type of range lookup, but a range verb has been added into RocksDB. There is a blog post that's actually written by the people at CockroachDB about this, and because of that, there are some inherent scan optimizations to RocksDB. So you might say, hey, um, this, this doesn't work for me because I actually search for data on ranges. It's not going to perform as well as some systems, but it's not going to perform as bad as you think. Always be sure to test. So uh, also uh, there's prefix bloom filters that are available, which takes that bloom filter concept uh, and makes it vastly more complex. Uh, if you want to read about it, there's a lot of more information out there about how to make that work to help with range scans, all that kind of stuff. But the bottom line is that range scans are a problem. It may not be as bad as you think. Test, test, test. Uh, there is some reduced functionality. Um, so you don't have online DDL, uh, which is a very important feature, which was added into MySQL 5.6, so you could actually make revisions to your table while they stayed online. Can't do that natively with MyRox. You'd have to go back to using something like PT Online Schema Change or Ghost in order to facilitate that, which might ruin your day. Uh, you can't have foreign keys. Personally, like back in the day when, uh, when I was doing architecture, and uh, database development. Uh, I would have looked at this and this would have been, no, absolutely not. Now that I'm in the database administration world, I'm a lot more aware of what foreign keys cost to a system, especially when we start talking about virtually synchronous systems like Galera or something like that. The cost is just astronomical. So I look at this and I say, hey, maybe I need to be just a little bit more trusting of my developers who are working on the application in order to make sure that my relationships are being properly preserved. So you don't have foreign keys in my rocks, but for me, that really depends on your comfort level. Me, I'm okay with it. Some people may not be. Uh, transportable table spaces. Uh, this is the ability to take your data, uh, make, put it into a consistent state on disk, and move it physically instead of having to use some kind of logical export process like MySQL dump, my dump, or my loader, uh, something like that. Um, not necessarily a deal breaker for a lot of people until you need it. Um, when it actually comes down to a point of saying, hey, I have, a, I have a one terabyte file and I need to move this over to another instance because it's gotten too big, that really sucks when you got to do that with MySQL dump. So again, proper capacity planning can help you avoid that problem, but it is something you need to be aware of. 
Uh, and the big one for me is select for update when using repeatable read isolation. Um, so this is where you actually uh, explicitly say, I want to have a, an exclusive lock on a record as I'm preparing it for update. This is not uh, part of scope for, for my rocks right now. I know it's something that they are working on. I've read some blog posts about that. Um, I couldn't tell you when it's going to come around, but you know they're aware of it. They know it's a big deal. So we can hopefully see uh, some news about that in the near future. So what does this all boil down to? Um, if you've got a data set that is, if you have an active data set that is larger than the amount of physical memory you have currently and you have no plans to grow your physical memory on your box, consider it. Uh, if, you're write, if you're write intensive, um, and if you have a lot of high concurrency that where you're not necessarily dependent upon looking up based off of scan, uh, for me, I, I think this is a great tool. Uh, it's still in its early stages. And to be perfectly honest, I don't have a production use case for it yet. All of this information that I've provided you today is based solely on my own research, lab testing, and theory, right? So anybody who's doing this now is technically an early adopter. But for me, I mean, the writing's on the wall. Lots of people are using this at the core of their product. People who have been doing LSM for a long time are giving this serious consideration. So I, I think this is something where we can expect that we're going to see a lot more from RocksDB and, and hopefully my rocks in, in the near future. So just to recap on everything that we covered today, uh, we talked a lot about how data gets in because again, we are in a write optimized system. We're talking about deferred write amplification. So these processes are super, super important. Uh, that happens through compaction. Uh, and we get our optimizations through compaction or, or compression rather in bloom filters. We talked about how data comes out and we actually took a look at some variables that were really crucial for configuration metrics that made it easier for us to get visibility into how our system's performing. Does anybody have any questions about the material that we've covered today? Oh, go for it, thank you. This is an add-on to the, the earlier question about you have so many variables, how do you tune, tune them? Can, can you do that automatically? My question is, uh, is there a profile or is there something that you can use to, to define an objective function so you can tell whether something is better or worse at runtime so that, so that either you can manually tune it or you can build some kind of auto-tuner? So my answer to that um, is, if I were to implement a MyRock system into production, or if I was at least doing a POC today, what I would do uh, is I would use PMM, which is a Percona uh, management and monitoring tool, yes. which is basically a visualization of those metrics. And it has the ability to create new metrics based off of uh, stuff that's exposed through uh, you know, show global status, uh, show global variables, that type of information, or even the information schema, right? You can query that as well and I create new metrics based off of that. Now, the bad news is, is to answer your question, no, there's nothing currently available, but I think that based off of the information that I have in my blog, it would be very, very easy to determine what it is specifically you want to look at for your use case and create those metrics and make them available to you visibly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep, sir. How are we supposed to think of column families? How do they relate to what the programmer sees in SQL. So I really would not try to think about it from uh, the perspective of a developer. This is purely uh, how you want to allocate physical resources to individual subsets of data within your instance. So we talked a lot about uh, you know, active mem tables. We talked a lot about compaction and compression and block filters, or uh, bloom filters rather, right? These are all things that can be assigned for each column family. Maybe you want to have a column family where there's no compression. Maybe you want to have one where there's no bloom filters. Maybe you want to have one column family that's dedicated to one specific resource where you can have one that's shared across multiple, right? Uh, so column families are really nothing more than a logical grouping of data where you can basically configure physical resources for it. Um, and where, is, where are there opportunities for concurrency here? Obviously, there's some places you can't have concurrency, but I don't know where you can. Um, I'm not exactly sure I understand your question. Well, you have um, an interface with a bunch of queries come, mm -hmm. and updates sure. and so on. Is, there's one server queue, I take it. Right. And it's all 
processed serially or is there concurrency? Uh, there is concurrency, absolutely, because the concurrency is actually built into MySQL, right? Um, so usually when we talk concurrency in MySQL, we're talking at about a higher level than the storage engine. But yeah, when you have multiple threads running in MySQL, you can have multiple requests down to the storage engine saying, hey, I need this record. I need to insert uh, some new information about this record. The only thing that really changes is that instead of making modifications to data on the fly like we would with NODB, all we're doing is uh, uh, concatenating to a log for rocks to be seeing this change has occurred. And that's one thing that actually makes high concurrent, right focused workloads work better for uh, my rocks than it does for NODB. Okay. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Sir? Are there any secondary indexes? Yes, oh yeah, sorry. There are secondary indexes. In fact, actually, um, one thing that's interesting about column families is that you can have your secondary index for your table located within the same column family or in, in a different spot. Uh, and another interesting thing about secondary indexes is that if you have a table and it already has a lot of data in it and you add a secondary index to that table, all of that data automatically gets flushed down to the lowest level of compaction immediately. So it doesn't go through the LSM structure, it just gets sent down to the lowest level right off the bat. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. No problem. Uh, similar to secondary indexes, uh, how does RocksDB handle views? So views are actually at a higher level with MySQL. Um, so I can only speak to MySQL on this. I don't really have a lot of familiarity with CockroachDB or uh, TyDB or Cassandra. Uh, but when you're dealing with views in, in MySQL, all it is is just, uh, you're basically just reserving a, a select statement. So you call the view and it just runs the select. So okay. it, it's not very complicated. I know it works a lot differently with Postgres. Yeah. Okay. Mm. James, Hi. welcome back. We, um, oh, this thing is. There we go. Uh, okay, so this is a, um, a, a delayed write amplification system, right? Yep. That's, That's yep. the objective for the sounds as though it's for not necessarily resource starved environments, but for environments that don't have massive gobs of RAM and you can still make it work. What happens on the day that your L6 exceeds 26 terabytes I'm and so glad you asked that question. Yeah, because that's going to be a really bad day. Actually, it's not. So uh. one, one thing I guess I should have made a little bit clearer, and I apologize, is that your compaction uh, triggers are, are based on size. We talked about that. God, I want to scroll back through all my slides, but bear with me. Um, so we talked about how L1 is restricted to 256 megs, and then each one is 10 times larger than the one that came before it, so on and so forth. So if we get to the bottomless, bottommost compaction layer at L6, in James's use case, we have 24 and a half terabytes of space. What happens if we get beyond that? The trigger points are not throttles once you get past L0, right? So it, it's a suggestion. We want to keep it in this area, but I actually tested that in my system. Um, I, I specified I wanted um, three compaction layers, and each compaction layer was something ridiculously minimal, like 10 megs. So the bottom one was 100 megs, and then I just slammed gigs and gigs and gigs and data into it. Uh, zero and one acted exactly as I would have expected to. is really good at maintaining its thresholds, but the bottom one, which I set to L, uh, L3, uh, just kept growing and growing and growing. So yeah, uh, it, it's a threshold, but it will allow you to exceed. So OK, what if you stop the service? Add an L4 match and turn it back on. So I tried that too because once I was done with the test, I reset it back to its defaults <laughs> and then turned it back on. I remember it didn't crash. <laughs> so um, I, I, the, the, the problem was is that um, I started it. Um, and before I actually monitored anything, I actually removed my tables because I wanted to move on to another test. But the, it, did, it did turn on. Uh, the data dictionary found all my space. It had no problems with the SST files that I had formed. I can only imagine that there's a lot of different things that trigger compaction and what actually starts the process of going through, look through your LSM tree to say, hey, check, check each uh, compaction level to find out whether it needs to be compacted. I would like to guess, and this is a guess, that as soon as it starts, that would trigger that process. It would go through the LSM tree, find uh, the one that was way too big, and then start compacting down to L, uh, what would have been uh, L3 at that point, 
uh, 0, 1, 2 was where I stopped, so it would have been down to 3. And the really brilliant thing about that is th L3 didn't exist for that column family at that point, so at that point it's just, well, there's nothing to merge down there. Send your data down. Again, guess, but we can always talk later and actually run a test. I'll ask one more. Sure. And that's, does this sound like a good scenario uh, for, for, the, for you? I've got a system where I've got 6,000 machines feeding into a single database, a whole bunch of small records. Okay. And every once in a while, we have to increase the size of the uh, MySQL database and increase the number of disk heads to get enough parallelism because the amount of writes slow down the reads something awful. It's, it's quite visible, busy part of the day, performance drags down. Um, I would actually start by looking at your MySQL configuration for what you currently have because there's yep. a number of different things that can cause what you're looking at, especially if, like, if, if your uh, NODB redo logs are too small or if you don't have a large enough log buffer that can cause the types of problems. Uh, if your uh, buffer pool is too small, the same thing, but usually that's yep. not a problem. It's just you know, one thing you can look at. Uh, but assuming you've exhausted all those things. Yeah. Um, yeah, sure. I, I would definitely take a look at it. Yeah. I mean, because if, you, if your system is dealing with tons and tons and tons of small rights, that, that's what this is all about. That's evil. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Thank you very much.